All right, great. All right, great. Um, so before I get started, um, let me ask how many people here are, are involved in the integrated ecosystem assessment for this region? Several. So at least half a dozen. Okay, that's great. That's great. That gives me some idea of how to focus this talk. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, the ecosystem assessment for the West Coast, which I've been heavily involved in. Um, I'll talk a lot about Atlantis. I'm actually here today at USF because Cam brought me and mostly to learn about what you guys are doing. Um, there's ecosystem assess assessment work going on. There's lots of great ecosystem modeling of all types here. Um, a lot of folks on the West Coast are asking questions about oil and oil spills, and I know nothing about them. Um, <laughs> but there seems to be interest, uh, some buzz about them recently. So um, I would love to learn about that while I'm here. And I'll actually be around all day, um, so I hope to meet many of you later. Um, so today I'll talk about the integrated ecosystem assessment for the U.S. West Coast from indicators to ecosystem models. <coughs> and um, really I want to give you an idea of the breadth of work that's going on on the West Coast, in particular at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, the Southwest Fisheries Science Center, and then collaborators, sort of academic collaborators, and then different branches of NOAA and uh, other agencies as well. Did you take you took that out, right? Oh, that's the. Apologize. That's all right. Yeah. This is all on YouTube, by the way. You can watch this yeah. whole thing on YouTube. <laughs> this part in particular. Um, um, so anyway, so today I'll talk about Atlantis, but also the ecosystem assessment. Um, I know everybody is not an Atlantis modeler. Everybody has different interests and different, um, different foci. But um, I want to give you a flavor for what's happening on the West Coast. So um, everything I talk about today is in the context of the West Coast Integrated Ecosystem Assessment. And this is really a, a framework for doing science to support ecosystem-based management. Um, this is a, a little diagram from... Um, Phil Levin's PLOS paper in 2009, and this kind of kicked off the IEA effort. If you go to this website, there's um, a good summary of different IEA efforts happening around the, the country. And um, today I'll just talk about the West Coast. And the IEA essentially has uh, the components shown here. So a scoping component, trying to figure out what the public and what stakeholders want out of your system. Um, an effort to identify and create time series of ecosystem indicators, uh, risk assessment, then some discussion of where is the system relative to where you want it to be as measured by your ecosystem indicators, and then management testing and scenarios, which is essentially projecting into the forward, uh, projecting into the future and thinking about um, what, you, uh, what you can do, how you can manage the system, and how the system is going to respond to, to drivers such as climate change. And so I'm going to walk you through some of these topics today. Uh, the first bit is related to ecosystem indicators. And um, partly I want to do this to give you some idea of things that have been going on on the West Coast, especially things we were doing three years ago, even before we started any of the complicated Atlantis modeling and ecosystem modeling. There were some really basic steps that we took to understand the system and trends in the system. Um, and this is the work primarily of Greg Williams and Kelly Andrews. And they essentially came up with a framework to evaluate and identify ecosystem indicators. So there was a five-step process. First, they came up with a list of hundreds and hundreds of ecological indicators. So these are time series from surveys, from monitoring, from fisheries data, everything they can think of that might be relevant to capture um, sort of the state of the California current. Um, secondly, they started screening that list of indicators um, and look, basically look, going through a list of criteria related to is it cost effective to get those indicators, what is the duration of time series, what is the duration of the time series for which the indicator is available, um, 
And then also, is, it, uh, is that indicator likely to be sensitive to change in the ecosystem? Is it likely to be specific to pointing to particular types of change or particular types of pressure on the ecosystem? So those were the screening criteria. Um, and then they went to the literature. And essentially, looking at the scientific literature, they scored each of these indicators to see um, is there a strong scientific support for using that in our case. Um, and so essentially, this is sort of a, a winnowing process going from about 300 or 400 indicator time series down to something more manageable, like 50 to 100. Um, they created a weighting, sort of a weighting system to summarize this information, and they came up with their final set. And I'll show you some of those indicators now. Um, the, the funny thing is, you know, as scientists, we came up with a set of 50 or so indicators that seemed to be absolutely great sent those to the Fishery Management Council, which is our primary audience for a lot of this. And they came back and said, could you just give us a dozen? <laughs> so now we're providing sort of a, a supplement document each year to them, which is the uh, status report of the California Current with just essentially their favorite dozen indicators, which I think is a, it's a big step forward on our coast. So um, in terms of climate indicators, <coughs> these are, uh, this is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation in the summer and winter. This is one of the major um, decadal scale climate drivers. And um, uh, one of the key things that we did on our coast was come up with a very standardized format for how to present indicators. And if you've ever been to a CDAR review or our equivalent star panels on the West Coast, when fishery managers review stock assessments, they like to have very standard formats that they look at. They have plots they expect to see. They have outputs they expect to see. And we're trying to create the same sort of standardized format here. So all of our indicator plots have, um, they're all normalized. So zero is the mean. One is one standard deviation or one, uh, one standard deviation above or below the mean. Um, the time series are shown here in red. And then we focus in on the last five years of the time series and look to see whether there's an increasing or decreasing trend in those last five years, shown here in green. That trend is reported as the, the topmost symbol here. And then the long-term trend over the duration of the time series is the, the lower symbol. Um, and so every single plot I'm going to show you has the same format. Sort of, you don't, once you look at it once, you don't have to think about the format again. Um, but these are our climate drivers. Basically, to managers on the West Coast, this is telling them that on the decadal scale, we expect it to be uh, sort of a cool, productive PDO regime, good for most of our fish stocks. Um, and that's true whether you look at the winter or the summer PDO metric. Um, in terms of lower trophic levels, a lot of the work of Bill Peterson and others suggests that we should focus on how many lipid-rich northern copepods are coming into our system, bringing in um, a lot of lipids and energy for our fish stocks, particularly salmon. Um, so we've had a good year for these northern fatty copepods um, in the last couple years, an increasing trend over the last five years. For upper trophic levels, um, following the work of Daniel Pauly and others, we, we calculate the mean trophic level. This is from groundfish survey data. So groundfish survey data usually feeds right into our stock assessments. Um, but we, what we've done here is um, come up with this community metric, which is mean trophic level of the groundfish survey catch. Um, and you can see a, a substantial decline in mean trophic level over the last 10 years or so, which is the, the time series for which we have this consistent groundfish survey. And this is, you know, you take this back to the fishery managers and they say, well, they actually knew about this, but they don't set it in this context. What's going on in this case is um, we had a really good year class in 1999, so a lot of Piscivorous fish, a lot of upper trophic level fish, um, were present in the early years here. And then eventually, as those year classes died out or were fished out, we've had declines in abundance of piscivores and then subsequently declines in mean trophic level. So all of these are just metrics of different parts of the ecosystem. And we're trying to wrap our brains around how to create time series, how to look at trends. Um, <coughs> For some of the protected species, like sea lions and birds, um, we also have very good time series for them. This is common mirrors. You can see common mirror um, density where they're monitored has been increasing in, in the last five years. And then for our targeted species, our harvested species, we have 
stock assessments, but typically um, the stock assessment output has just been viewed in terms of catch or biomass over recent years, sometimes spawning stock biomass or depletion. Um, but what we're doing here is actually, this is what work we did in 2012. The IEA team had a pretty heavy involvement from the groundfish stock assessment folks. So we brought them in and said, what can you tell us about the condition of the population? And by that we mean the age structure and the size structure of these, of these fish, of these groundfish. And so they can pull that out of their assessment results. They don't usually do so, but they were willing to do it in, for this ecosystem context. And so you can see um, through time, basically the effect of decades of fishing has been a decrease in the proportion of um, mature fish in the population and then also a decrease in the 95th percentile of the age of the, of the fish in the population. And you can see both fishing effects, and then you can see the, um, uh, for instance, a recruitment effect um, in 1999. But um, essentially the story from the ground fish assessments was that we could, we could get more information out of the assessments if we just thought about what it was we wanted besides total biomass and spawning stock biomass. Um, in this same context of coming up with time series of indicators, there was also a big focus by Kelly Andrews in particular to create time series of pressures. So what are the pressures on the system? And those included pressures like pollution, species invasions, and shipping activity. And um, I think we're quite lucky on the West Coast because Ben Halpern has created some of these layers. So there are GIS layers of major activities, major pressures. There's also a global database for that. Um, it might be a little bit more coarse on your coast, but it does. I think these maps do exist globally. Um, but essentially, we have some some maps of where are these pressures occurring. Is that shipping pressure fish vessels or no vessels? No, that's that's uh, freighters. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's freighters, and so that's from. Um, I don't know if that's Coast Guard data or, or but yeah, it's basically. Um, you'll see you'll see another plot showing it in a second, but. Um, you know, this, we're, we're trying to think about this in the context of pollution, also species invasions, also uh, ship strikes for marine mammals. Um, so from these data, we're able to extract time series of different pressures. So for instance, um, here's your uh, metric of commercial shipping activity. So we have um, you know, shipping departures and arrivals, and then we also have shipping volume and displacement. Um, I think the, the Coast Guard and the, the marine exchanges track these things pretty closely. Um, other pressures, fisheries removals, offshore oil, oil and gas activity, which is pretty minimal um, on the West Coast. Uh, nutrient inputs from fertilizers, and then dredging, typically by the Army Corps of, Engineer, of Engineers. Um, so these are all pressures we're trying to think of. You know, most of the IEA scientists sit at the fisheries service, um, uh, but we're trying to think broadly about all of the pressures on the ecosystem. What are the trends and what are the spatial patterns there? Um, so the, the next step of the IEA was really to take these pressures and try to link them, uh, link them into risk assessment and risk analysis. And this is primarily the work of Jamil Samhuri, uh, who's also in Seattle with, with us. But um, essentially he was looking at, um, the, this is a case study from the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuaries, which is one of our, our largest sanctuaries on the West Coast. Uh, but the question is, for species we're interested in and habitats we're interested in, what is, the, uh, what is the impact of the pressures that we just talked about? So species and habitats in this case include hard bottom, soft bottom, coral, sponges, sea mounts, the pelagic areas, et cetera. Um, and these are essentially identified by the sanctuaries as their priority habitats and priority species. And then given those species, what is the likely impact of different pressures? And the pressures include um, habitat modification pressures and then also pollution um, and habitat modification is things like trawling, sediment input, and coastal engineering, which is hardening the shoreline, building piers, docks, etc. Um, so we're sort of moving away from just looking at the trends and the pressures and trying to figure out what they might mean to species we care about. And this, for the most part, this is a GIS analysis. Um, the first part is to simply map out the habitats or species of interest. So these are um, this, the distribution of hard and soft bottom habitats in Monterey Bay Sanctuary. Then this is the distribution of inorganic pollution in the sanctuary. 
Um, you can see there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of pollution input coming in here at, at Elkhorn Slough. Salinas River comes in here, um, and then generally more pollution near the shore and up towards San Francisco. Um, and this analysis is again a GIS overlap analysis, looking at um, where does the organic pollution overlap with the different habitat types. In this case, soft bottom and hard bottom habitat. And essentially, we're creating an overlap index. What is the, the magnitude of overlap or exposure for habitats with the pressure? And then, um, you know, going back to my point about trying to create standardized plots where if a manager looks at them this year and next year, they're always going to have the same format. Um, one of the standardized plots is this type of risk assessment plot. And essentially, what Jamil did here is. Um, look at the exposure. So this is the spatial overlap between the habitat and the pressure. Um, the pressure in this case is all inorganic pollution. So this is exposure. You've got some places like beaches and rocky shores that have high exposure because they're near the, um, you know, very near the rivers, very near the coast. You've got other um, habitats like corals and seamounts and sponges that are farther offshore. So they have less exposure and less overlap. And then we're also, this y-axis here is plotting the sensitivity of those species or habitats to the pressure. And the x-axis is from this GIS overlap. The y-axis is mostly from uh, uh, compiling expert opinion, which uh, in truth, that's sort of the state of the art of understanding how these pressures affect habitats and species. Um, but given this sort of collected expert opinion, um, we think that species like corals and seamounts have relatively high sensitivity given their exposure with the pressure, um, while as some other sort of generic offshore habitats might have lower sensitivity. Um, so this is the type of format that Jamil has created for lots of different pressures, not just pollution, um, and then different habitat types and species types. And we've even done this for um, selected ground fish species. So instead of habitats, we just focused on some of our major ground fish species as a way to sort of convey this information to the fishery council that tends to focus on a you know, ground fish harvested species basis. This is uh, quite the lawnmower you have here. <laughs> it's not going to help because it's only for YouTube. Uh, you're welcome to move forward if you want. Um, I, I, I can try to yell. I'm not a good yeller, though. Um, OK, so the part of the IEA that I've been most involved with is um, the management testing and scenarios portion. And this is the portion where we really try to use ecosystem models and other models that we have available to project into the future, to look at drivers like climate change, and to look at different policy options and what they mean for the ecosystem. Um, and the, this had a, a couple different parts in 2012. The first part was essentially a narrative portion, just getting managers and scientists to think about what are the different future scenarios for the California current. So this is, this is storytelling. This is not science, the first bullet point. The second bullet point basically is let's see what quantitative models we have, ecosystem models and others that will allow us to project forward in time and look at sort of ecosystem level impacts of these drivers and pressures. Um, so this was sort of fun. So last year I got to go into I got to pretend to be a social scientist, um, which I'm definitely not. Um, uh, but I got to talk to 16 different experts in these, um, I, I just call them conversations. But they were sort of hour-long conversations where the experts laid out what they thought the um, sort of the future was for their portion or their species in the California current. And from those conversations, um, collaborators and I constructed these five different narratives about what the future would hold. And these are really narratives about drivers. What are drivers going to do in the California current? Um, and they're, they're not very complex, but at least they get people thinking. Um, the first sort of set of drivers that we discussed was population growth. So both population growth on the West Coast and then population growth globally. The second set of um, narratives and conversations we focused on involved the conservation demand. And I mean, this was just a, a, a sentiment that Essentially, ever since the late 70s, we've been shifting away from a strictly extractive use of the marine environment towards more of a focus on conservation, protecting biodiversity, protecting endangered species. 
um, and uh, uh, you know recovering depleted stocks, and that we might expect to see more of those uh, either from a policy standpoint or maybe from a consumer standpoint in the future. The third set of um, ideas in the scenarios were uh, about climate change. And in truth, we didn't actually do much modeling on climate change last year. This year, we're going to do more of a focus on climate change. Um, but almost every manager we talked to was aware of climate change. They knew it might impact their species. They didn't know exactly how. Um, but they were starting to worry about it and starting to think of what could they monitor and, and um, what should they expect in terms of impacts. Um, we also had uh, a narrative related to energy crunch. So uh, fishing vessels in particular are very sensitive to high fuel prices. So there was a lot of discussion of that and what it meant for fishing effort and fishery, fisher, uh, fishery targeting. Um, uh, and then obviously other sectors too are influenced by energy crunch. In particular on the west coast we have a lot of hydropower um, and there's a trade-off between salmon and hydropower and the um, uh, you know, we talked about the energy crunch in the context of needing more, needing more energy from hydropower with potentially less water available from hydropower. And then finally there was a, a narrative related to the status quo and in our case status quo essentially meant status quo ground fish regulations, which had just begun to include catch shares or individual quotas, and I'll talk more about that. But the, essentially the regulations had just gone into place and nobody knew how those were going to play out in terms of fishery, sort of fishery behavior and fishery effort. And so um, it was status quo regulations, but evolving fishery effort behavior. So I just want to show you one of these in, in detail. Um, and this is, the, this is kind of the sort of narrative uh, thought experiment we did. Um, and really these were conversations and then we pulled them together into what we call the post-it diagrams. But this is our post-it diagram for population growth. We have west coast population growth and global population growth. And the global population growth really means um, very specifically growth in population and affluence of particular markets, specifically markets in Asia that demand our seafood. So we have Dungeness crab being exported to China, which is a new, a new market. Um, we have sort of a demand for, say, plate-sized fish in Southern California being exported to Asia. We have a Japanese market for sable fish. Um, very targeted markets um, with uh, increasing or potential increases in demand. So we talked about West Coast population growth leading to increased demand for water. Um, potential need to prioritize hydropower over salmon, um, more and more demand for energy, which could translate into increases in uh, things like wave energy and wind energy, um, as well as potentially LNG plants, and then potentially increased ship traffic, which is relevant for pollution, invasive species, and uh, mammal strikes at least. And then global increases in population and affluence relate to harvest of new species. Um, and then gear changes that would be required to harvest those new species or larger volumes of existing species, um, and then potentially port level social and economic effects. And so if you see the color coding here on the chart, um, the yellow is essentially just, we left it at the narrative stage. These are um, uh, you know, ideas that the experts had, ideas that came out of the conversations, but we didn't have any models ready to go to address those. And then the blue text and blue post-its are all things for which we had data, we had models, and we could actually move to the next step, which is making quantitative predictions about these things. So um, the modeling approaches that we used <coughs> were, um, were many. I'm going to talk a lot about the, the Atlantis modeling that I did, the two Atlantis projects. But we had seven different chapters, seven different analyses, using about six different um, uh, six different frameworks for models, um, ranging from single species models to economic models to GIS overlap analyses to Atlantis. Um, so I'll give you two appetizers and two entrees okay. for free. Um, so that the first appetizer here is this uh, analysis of wave energy. So this was the work of Mark Plummer and Blake Feist. And essentially it used um, Marine Invest, which is a software, GIS software tool from the Natural Capital Project. And they used this essentially to cite <coughs> where wave energy would be profitable 
off the Oregon coast. Those are the, the sites here, here, and here. And then this was just a sort of an overlap analysis, an overlay analysis to look at what human uses and what essential fish habitat would potentially conflict with these wave energy sites. Um, and in this case, this, is, this green area here is sturgeon habitat. And their main point was that um, in cases where you, if you're required to put your, um, your wave energy sites close to shore, probably because the, if the transmission cable was very expensive, if copper was very expensive to, to get your energy from there to the grid, um, you would need to have your sites at the blue spots here. And that's the largest overlap with sturgeon habitat. And the offshore sites, uh, wave energy sites farther offshore, have less conflict with this particular species. I mean, the pattern is simply that you have lower energy as you go further offshore, right? No, no actually, it's the opposite in this case. Where's the water in that, in that image? Is it the um, or is it the white? This is the coastline here. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is the essential fish habitat for sturgeon. And then um, the highest energy is offshore here. Well, that's cost level. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, this is cost level. So the highest energy is off here, but it takes a lot of copper cable to get out there. Um, if copper cable is expensive, you need to be near your grid point, near the connection point. Um, and so it, it's, it was nice because the analysis basically boils down to one factor, which is the price of copper. The global price of copper determines your overlap with all these protected species and fishery uses and shipping, et cetera. Um, and then the final, your, your second um, appetizer here, uh, is just my plug for using simple economic models when they're available. We did this for ground fish and then for salmon as well. And essentially these models, these, uh, they're called input-output models. They make short-term forecasts that translate from fisheries catch and fisheries revenue into um, revenue and income in the broader economy and jobs in the broader economy. Um, we found this to be a great way to translate from you know, fisheries, which in truth very few people care about, to um, jobs, which every politician loves to talk about. Um, and jobs in the broader economy, not just the fishing economy. And so um, the, uh, the, the analysis for Klamath salmon basically predicted about a $7 million increase in salmon fishery revenue. And then Cindy Thompson was able to translate that into a $9 million um, increase in gross revenue to the broader economy. and then specific predictions in job increases at the port level. Um, and so it, it's one way of taking our sort of ecology and fisheries modeling and making it relevant to economics. OK, so um, now you're into the entrees. And I'm going to um, finish up the rest of the talk by going through two of our, um, two of our recent Atlantis modeling exercises. And I'll go through these in some detail. Hopefully, you guys will have questions. Um, and uh, the first part of the talk was all about the process we go through. This is more about how we actually do the modeling. Um, this is a paper that Cam mentioned. Um, and this portion of our work last year for the IEA focused on the role of forage fish as prey. Um, so on the West Coast and globally, we know that forage fish like sardine and anchovy and herring on our coast, menhaden, and herring on your coast, probably. Um, these species are a large portion of the of predator diets. These are four of our West Coast predators. And you can see for our coast, for these groups, um, forage fish here in black comprise about 40 to 80% of those predator diets. Um, and the question really is, how much does this matter? So um, uh, you know, these are just average diets. But if you take forage fish out of a predator diet, can they switch to something else? You know, are there other species that they can eat? Um, what is the sort of population level uh, biomass response or reproductive response to decreases in forage fish? Um, and there's been a lot of focus on forage fish recently. Um, there was the Lenfest Ocean Task Force on forage fish. Um, there was a lot of uh, work done by the Marine Stewardship Council to understand the role of forage fish and how that should be taken into account for um, eco-labeling or eco-certifying different fisheries. Um, and a lot of this work sort of follows, follows from those. Uh, but uh, 
this study by Curie also came out, and I think it was maybe inspired or part of the Lenfest Ocean Task Force. Um, but this is one case where the authors, these were um, primarily seabird biologists. They had 18 different seabird species from around the world. They had time series of seabird reproductive success and prey abundance. And they, um, essentially what they showed is that um, as prey abundance decreases to about one-third of its maximum value, it, you expect to see a, a threshold response, a sharp decrease in the reproductive success of seabirds. And so their, their takeaway from this global meta-analysis was that you should leave about one-third of forage stocks for the birds. Um, so basically establish some minimum threshold. And if biomass falls below that, don't fish the forage stock. And I think this is a, you know, perhaps a useful rule of thumb, but it's hard to get fishery managers or industry to actually um, you know, manage fish stocks on the basis of rules of thumb. And so we, we were interested in looking at our system, looking at our fisheries, and trying to understand what is the role of forage fish, what happens to the rest of the system when forage fish decline. And so this is a paper that we, um, we it was in the IEA for last year, and then it, it just came out recently in environmental conservation. Um, but we asked, what's the effect of depleting forage fish, krill, uh, metophids, and mackerel? And I put a question mark up there for mackerel because they're um, uh, perhaps a bit large and, and somewhat piscivorous. Um, uh, but at the same time, they're a pelagic species like many of these. Um, they form schools. And they, um, uh, they are major prey items for some of the, the larger offshore predators. So, um, so if we deplete the, our question was, if we deplete these, what happens to the rest of the food web? We use two different models. And I think this is important in the context of the IEA to understand we're trying to use as many, as many models as we can to address each question that we have. Here we used an ecosim model developed by John Field. This is for the Northern California Current. Um, it models things at the functional group level. Uh, the model starts at uh, Cape Mendocino right here in Northern California and extends up to the Canadian border. And at a sardine functional group and then a, forage, a specific forage fish functional group. Um, which, well, the sardines were at the species level, but the other species were sort of aggregated into one category. And this model does not, it does not include space. So um, I think many of you probably know about Ecopath with Ecosim, but this is just the, uh, the non-spatial version. This is not Ecospace, for those of you who know the jargon. Um, so the other model we applied to this question was our Atlantis model. This is the model um, extends from Point Conception in Southern California up to the Canadian border. It is spatially explicit. It has about 60 different functional groups, and we just had one krill group, one mackerel group, um, one mctophid group, and then all of our forage fish are lumped into a single category, a single functional group. Um, we're, we're rebuilding the model right now to include uh, forage fish more at the species level, but for this analysis, it's just um, one lumped group of forage fish. Um, I'll just show you a couple slides on Atlantis. I think some of you are deeply involved in Atlantis right now, but um, for those of you who aren't, this is a, uh, an integrated ecosystem model. It includes human impacts, an ecology submodel, and an oceanography submodel. And um, the oceanography, in our case, is driven by ROMS, a regional ocean modeling system. The biology basically involves tracking things in terms of their biogeochemistry using nitrogen as a currency. And then we have um, competition and predation happening at the level of the ecology submodel. And then fishing is happening on top of all of this. And we were just simulating sort of uh, simple fishing mortality rates rather than complicated fleet dynamics. Uh, the oceanography is forced by ROMS, which is essentially moving nutrients and phytoplankton around. Um, well, moving nutrients and plankton around on the grid. And again, the forage groups we tested were uh, euthousids or krill, forage fish, um, mesopelagics, uh, or mctophids, sardine, and mackerel. And just to give you some, some preview of the, the results here, if you look at the percent of the system biomass for each of these models that's comprised of euthousids and forage fish, you can see both of them are at about 10% or more of the biomass. So these are very important species. These are very abundant, and they're also very prevalent in predator diets. 
And so not surprisingly, in a couple slides, you'll see those have the largest impacts on the food web. So the, the first part of this was to um, sort of take a step back and just look at the question from a single species perspective. Um, and what that means is we tested a range of fishing mortality rates on the x-axis here. And for our focal stock, so forage fish or euphousids or whatever, for the focal stock, we looked and saw how did biomass decline with fishing and how did yields, what was the yield response or the catch response, um, long-term catch response in relation to fishing. And so from this, we were able to look at, to estimate what is the fishing mortality rate that's associated with um, depletion, biomass depletion levels to 75% of unfished levels or 40% of unfished levels or um, near zero, uh, basically full extirpation of the species. So we needed those fishing mortality rates, and then we implemented those, I mean, those were implemented in Atlantis and Ecosim, and we could look and see what the response was to the, the rest of the food web. Um, and this, this is our sort of standardized response plot. So Atlantis here is in purple, Ecosim is in black. If a species didn't respond, it's right here on the zero line. You can see forage fish. This is a test case for forage fish, so we tried, we're intentionally depleting forage fish, either fully depleting them, depleting them to about 75%, 50%, or 20% of their unfished abundance. Um, and then the response of the rest of the food web is shown uh, here. And actually, I'm just showing you some of the lower trophic levels. I've, there's a, obviously there's responses all the way through the food web. But um, uh, the, the, the main point is that we see um, uh, increases in some of the competitors, some of the um, lower trophic level species like uh, the smaller zooplankton and euphousids. Um, uh, we also see increases in mackerel, which in some cases are competing with forage fish, and they're also um, benefiting from this increase in euphousids. Uh, we also see decreases in some of the predators. Here you can see hake, and then some of the other higher level predators as well were decreasing due to the loss of this prey item, the forage fish prey, uh, from their diets. So we summarized these simply by looking at the, um, the percent of species that were impacted substantially, and we used 20% as our cutoff for substantial. So if you were impacted by more or less than, by positive 20% or negative 20%, um, that response was tallied here on the y-axis. And as you can see, when we deplete the forage fish group or forage species group, you see larger and larger impacts, larger and larger numbers of species impacted throughout the food web. Um, these are the ecosystem results for euphousids and forage fish. So up to 60% of species in the food web respond strongly when forage fish and euphousids are depleted fully. And our Atlantis model also predicts strong responses through the food web, but only for about uh, 20 or 25 percent of the, um, of the species, in particular a lot of predator species. Um, so these are for krill and forage fish, and then we also tested mctophid and sardine and mackerel, and those responses are lower primarily because these are lower biomass groups um, with less of a sort of ecosystem or food web impact. So the conclusions here were that um, Depleting forage groups to 40% had both positive and negative effects. So you see that sort of purple bar chart had things moving in both directions. It was sort of a general disturbance to the food web, but not, not all of the impacts were negative. Um, predators commonly were impacted in a negative fashion. Forage fish and euphousids were the main story here. Um, and, and one of the things that, um, that I think is worth pointing out is that at least on the West Coast, many of our ground fish stocks are managed so that they're maintained at about 40% of unfished biomass. So if the stock is you know, half of, at half of its historical maximum, that's fine. That's, that's kind of our, our target abundance. Um, depleting forage fish and euphousids to these levels um, caused pretty strong impacts throughout the rest of the food web. Um, and on, just to give some context, on the West Coast, currently we have a ban on fishing krill but there are krill fisheries in other parts of the world. Um, forage fish are, we attempt to, to keep their abundance at higher than 40%, um, but the stock, the sardine stock in particular is currently declining. Um, so that's uh, it's sort of a, a, suggests a different set of reference points that's needed for 
forage species versus other species like groundfish. Um, and this work also played through into uh, some of Tony Smith's, this was uh, Tony Smith's science paper, looking at the trade-off between yield, uh, fishery yield versus impacts on the rest of the food web. Okay, you ready for your last entree? Okay. No, no, this, this is the entree. But this paper's in review, and I'm, I'm hoping if it gets through the reviewers, um, which I think it should, um, it'll be dessert, yeah. Okay, so this was um, an attempt to look at fleet dynamics for the U.S. West Coast groundfish trawl fleet. Um, the trawl fleet, as of January 2011, it switched over to a catch share fishery. And uh, this, you'll hear me say ITQ or catch share. ITQs are individual transferable quotas. These are essentially quotas where um, <coughs> each vessel or each fisherman is given a proportion of the total quota. They can fish it. They can fish it essentially when they want. Um, they have some flexibility in where they catch it, obviously. Um, and there's no more race for fish. There's no more. Um, we used to have two-month blocks of quotas that were essentially given to each vessel. Um, those are gone. And we also now have full observer coverage. So we used to have a system where discarding was uh, sometimes recorded in logbooks, but maybe not necessarily always recorded. Observer coverage used to be about 20%. Now we have observer coverage on every single vessel, and every single amount of catch is, is recorded and counted against quotas for that vessel. So this started in January 2011. Um, and I, I think you have catch shares for some of your fisheries here as well, right? OK, so you, don't, you probably don't need a lot of background. But um, you know, globally, these things have been increasing. Uh, this catch share management started in the 70s and 80s in places like New Zealand and Iceland. That has increased um, uh, with over 100 catch share fisheries here uh, globally uh, that have est established since the 80s. Um, and generally, fisheries without catch shares seem to have a higher proportion of the stocks that collapse than fisheries with catch shares. And this is a graph from Costello et al. But the Fishery Council um, had about a, at least a five or seven year process discussing this. In 2011, they switched this over to catch shares. And our question when we started this modeling was essentially, um, can we model the incentives and human behavior that determine fishing behavior and fishing effort. Um, what would we expect to see under catch shares? And then how does this affect stock dynamics? And um, you know, in one sense, you, you, the empirical people would probably say, why don't we just look at the data? Because we have, right now, we have two years of data um, from the catch share program. And there are people doing that. Um, <coughs> but the answer is that um, uh, the first two years, probably the first five years of any catch share program are essentially burn-in. It's a learning process. Fishermen are figuring out how to deal with the system, how to trade quota, where to fish, what markets to develop. Um, so if you want to understand sort of long-term behavior five or six or ten years out, you need to start thinking about uh, how to model it. So again, we used our Atlantis model. Um, we added a couple tweaks. In particular, we had to add some of our groundfish species they had been in functional groups. We needed to break them out and model them at the species level. And that's because um, uh, quotas for species like Pacific Ocean perch and widow rockfish, quotas are at the species level and they're tight. There's, I mean, there are some species for which vessels will have pounds of quota for the entire year. I mean, if you catch two fish, you're, you're out. <laughs> um, so we added these species. We added their spatial distributions. Um, and essentially, we tried to model two types of fishery. The first was the system we had prior to catch shares. This was a cumulative trip limit. Um, so we had 12 major ports. We sort of standardized everything to three-day trips. We included effort-related costs, fixed costs. Um, discards were free. Essentially, discards were not counted against your, your quota previous to our existing system. Um, quota was free. It was just. Um, it was just allocated. There was no cost to it. Um, and we assume that fleets maximize net profits, so at gross profit minus fixed and variable costs. Um, and then under catch shares, we had a sort of a different model set up for the fleets and the fleet behavior. Um, this involved um, modeling quota price. 
And again, for the West Coast, we don't exactly know what quota prices will be. We, um, the quota market has been very erratic in the last year or two. Um, so we needed some proxy. We used a model by Newell et al. from New Zealand. Um, we looked at uh, rockfish. So that's for the target species, is following the New Zealand model. Rockfish quota is allowed to increase up to some maximum value because rockfish are the, the sort of limiting step. That's a, those are species for which very little quota is available. And then essentially we're saying you can't freely discard anymore. Um, when quota is exhausted, the quota price is raised to some penalty level, um, which means essentially that you'll be, the observers will catch you and you'll have to pay a fee, pay a fine for exceeding your quota. So I'll show you results that involve seven different scenarios for fleet dynamics. Um, this is the old landings limit system prior to catch shares. This competitive TAC is essentially a catch share system where vessels can trade quota freely, but there's no, no cost to the quota. Um, and there's no, there's no cost to discarding. So it's a very, um, it's sort of a, a test case for what happens if you can suddenly trade quota all over the coast with no other restrictions. And then these uh, individual transferable quota, these sort of more realistic quota scenarios, involve different setups for penalties for exceeding quota, quota lease cost, um, and then this uh, cost for basis, basically cost for rockfish quota, the very scarce rockfish quota. Um, this is just to give you an idea of the, the dynamics, the fleet dynamics under the old system, under the landings limit system. It was a two-month block system, and the model is, uh, of course, we're feeding that into the model. So you see vessels essentially fishing a couple trips, and then they tie up for the rest of the two months. They fish a couple trips, they tie up. They fish a couple trips, and they tie up. So that's their, that's their response to, um, to the, the uh, previous uh, management system. And then these are sort of the, uh, I'll show you two, two graphs that look like this. But these are uh, trawl hours or trawl effort of each of our 12 fleets. So the fleets are arranged from south to north, Morro Bay to Nia Bay. Um, and there's a lot of lines and a lot of bars here. But the take-home message is that um, without penalties, we see s sharp increases in effort. So penalties for exceeding your target species catch. So the catch are the things you actually want to go after. Um, those penalties, when they're absent, you see large increases in effort relative to what we saw prior to catch shares. When the penalties, and these were penalties of about $5 per kilogram, when those penalties were present, um, the catch share system had moderate amounts of effort that were typically near the levels of fishing effort we had prior to catch shares. Um, this is the metric ton catch of our bycatch species, our rockfish catch species. Um, again, basically that the penalties that fishermen pay for exceeding, exceeding their target species quota are the key things. Without those penalties present, you see large increases in bycatch. With those penalties present, you see um, steady or decreasing bycatch relative to the system you had prior to catch shares. The biomass response, the species response, um, essentially is the, is the same story. Um, there are some species that catches don't vary much between the scenarios. The fishery management scenarios didn't necessarily change the fishing effort that much for these species. So you see yellow eye canary and Boccaccio rockfish have about the same dynamics no matter what. Dark blotched rockfish, though, um, had basically species recovery with the penalties present. Without the penalties present, you see declines in overfishing. And then this is the same thing for two of our target species. Um, sablefish and large flatfish basically show um, uh, sort of stable or increasing biomasses through time when you're putting that penalty, that cap on fishing effort. Um, sablefish and large flatfish, two of our target species, decline steeply when you uh, when you don't have the penalties present. And then the final part of this project was basically to go back to the economics and calculate net revenue. Um, and essentially, all of our scenarios here, um, whether it was the old catch, um, the old landings limit system, or the ITQ systems, the catch share systems with the penalties, they all end up, after sort of a burn-in period, they all end up with about the same um, net revenue. It's the situations where you had an ITQ without an adequate penalty 
for exceeding quota, where you end up with overfishing. You actually end up with overfishing. You end up with more effort. More effort costs you more in terms of fuel and variable costs, and net revenue declines. Um, so the take-home message here was um, without penalties, ITQs were, were basically disastrous. <laughs> Um, if you suddenly allow fishermen to trade quotas all over, up and, down the quo up, up and down the coast, everyone will fish until that quota is exhausted, and they'll keep discarding um, the species for which they don't have quota. Now, that's not realistic, but I think it's a, a useful point to make. Adding the penalties for exceeding quota was really the key thing here. Um, you know, we worried a lot. We, uh, Dan Holland was the economist on this. He worried a lot about how to model quota price. Um, and there's a literature on this. Um, economists love to think about you know, what determines the price that fishermen pay or are willing to pay for quota. It turns out that's really less important to fishing fleet dynamics, at least for our system. That's our result. Um, uh, quota prices for the target species and for the, um, the bycatch species are not the major factor here. They might affect who gets the revenue from the fishery. So if the quota is, has to be leased from someone who's not a fisherman, that revenue might go elsewhere. But the actual amount of fishing effort, where it occurs, what it's targeting, that was not influenced by quota price. Um, I did not show you these results, but there's a difference in ports. Essentially, we did this overlap analysis looking to see what ports had the highest overlap with the bycatch species. In our case, the southern ports were catching less bycatch species. They had less overlap. And they were actually able to increase their effort under ITQs. Northern ports, more overlap and higher bycatch, historically tended to not be able to increase their fishing effort. So we had winners and losers between ports. Um, and then also we had some winners and losers between species. You have to remember that the fleets here were essentially, um, they were trying to optimize net profits. And so they could, um, they could increase their target species catch. They could decrease catch of one bycatch species and sort of save money there. And um, increase the catch of a different bycatch species and you know, sp spend money on the quota for that bycatch species. So there were winners and losers between the species as well. OK, um, so a last slide here. So taking a step back and thinking about the IEA, um, not just the Atlantis modeling, but the full range of modeling that we've done. The, um, you know, the, the, the first thing we did was say, what, what can we do in year one uh, without having uh, you know, the Atlantis model ready to go without having uh, lots of other models ready to go. We could collect indicators, get our time series together, look at trends in the indicators, and then start to try to map these things spatially. Look at the overlap between pressures and things we care about, species or habitats. Um, then we took a step back and said, what models can we use to understand economic and social impacts? In our case, we had two input-output economic models that were ready to go that we could start to, uh, start to use to understand economic impacts. Um, we had at least one model that we could apply from the Marine Invest project to look at um, wave energy to start to understand non-fishing sectors. And that's honestly kind of out of my comfort range. Um, but the, uh, you know, the IEA is trying to think very broadly about shipping, about wave energy, about sectors beyond just fishing. And then after that, at the end, we start getting into what can you do with large-scale ecosystem models, um, looking at ecosystem-level implications of fishery management. And then this year, we're moving more into uh, sort of climate change and global change as well. So uh, thanks very much. I have time for, I guess I have five minutes for questions. <laughs> um, and I'll be around all day. I, I don't think Cam's going to chase me out of here um, anytime soon. And I also wanted to thank Cam for bringing me here somebody for paying. I think it's USF. So <laughs> thanks a lot. And also to thank the folks back in Seattle and also at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center who helped me put this presentation together and also helped me uh, sort of with my modeling work over the years. So thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. I have a question about the comparison of the two models, uh, the um, Atlantis and Ecosystem, Ecosystem yeah. model. The, the thing that surprised me was the cocoa pods and the salmon had different predictions in the opposite directions. Yeah. Why is that? Um, 
Atlantis is not doing a good job of modeling salmon in particular. Um, and uh, so I think Atlantis is just dead wrong for salmon. Uh, it's really hard to get that species right. Uh, for copepods, I need to go back and check. But we, we wrote about that in the paper. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, we, we, we discussed that in the paper, and I don't remember exactly. But yeah, there's definitely cases where one model will, um, uh, th there's basically some agreement and some disagreement on what the exact species responses are. And there's also agreement, um, there's sort of agreement that more fishing on forage fish causes larger impacts, but the magnitude is larger for ecosim. And there's sort of structural reasons in ecosim for that. And I think that really speaks to the need to have, you know, more than just ecosim in your pocket, more than just Atlantis in your pocket. Get as many models together as possible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks. That's great. Um, one thing it made clear was that notion of integrated ecosystem assessment is not like a done deal. It's a process. And the process is probably going to be in various stages, I, I would guess. I need to read what you asked at the beginning of that. Yeah. Status of the Gulf of Mexico, I know. And we go in fits and starts is how we do it. Um, and one of the things that I was going to ask you is how much of your effort on the West Coast is, um, is funded by NOAA? How much of it is uh, integrates universities and other stakeholders? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, I would really direct you to Phil Levin to understand the, the funding. Um, uh, a lot of the work we do is really probably on base funds, whether it's at the fisheries service or the sanctuary. Um, we don't have a huge budget overall. I know that. Um, uh, and we're trying to collaborate more with academics and more with um, state agencies. Uh, honestly, I don't think we're doing a great job of that yet. We're, this year in particular, for 2013, we're going to have uh, probably one chapter by a master's student at University of Washington. And then we have, um, <coughs> for the Atlantis modeling in particular, um, we're rebuilding the model to include uh, forage fish, to do a better job including forage fish, and to um, handle ocean acidification. And that's a sort of major collaboration with Tim Essington at University of Washington. Um, so we have some academic collaboration. Um, but that sort of the exact funding streams are a couple levels above me. But I can put you in touch with, with Phil if you want. Yeah. Kim. Um, yeah, I have to look up the copepod question because I'm um, pretty sure we, we've tackled that before. Um, but, but overall, the, the fact that ecosim is more dynamic and predicts stronger responses to almost any perturbation you throw at it, I mean, we see that, I, th I, think, I think you'd agree, um, I mean, we see that pretty consistently across all these models. Um, and I think, I think you're right, I think space is a big part of it. Um, in Atlantis, the predator and prey actually have to be in the same place to eat, each, you know, <laughs> for predation to occur. Um, in ecosim, you just have basically one bathtub, and everything can eat everything else. There's no spatial refuge. Um, also in Atlantis, you have these delays that involve life history. So you have you're explicitly modeling life stages. Um, that's not in this particular ecosim. Um, and you also have delays, sort of um, delays in the biomass response or the population response that are built into. Um, uh, you know, things like age at maturity and gape, none of that is in that version of ecosim. So you, you sort of expect the fast dynamics to happen in the, the straight ecosim equations. Yeah, Mike. Oh, uh, sorry, no, <laughs> so, sorry. Um, so I'm curious, in addition to the differences, obviously, between the programming and the code and how everything is set up, you know, I teach a field that eco fields that ecosim, you guys at Atlantis. What, was there any effort put in trying to standardize functional groups, trying to standardize the diet matrix, trying to stand, you know, like Yeah. Um, not for that project, because that's a major effort. 
Um, but going back to the collaboration with University of Washington and Tim Essington, um, yeah, so right now we're trying to build, we're rebuilding Atlantis. His student, Laura Cohen, is rebuilding her ecopath, so taking John Field's ecopath and updating it. Um, and for lots of practical reasons, and then also for model comparison reasons, we're trying to standardize as much as possible, standardize the functional groups, the diets. Yeah, yeah, so you really want to sort of factor those things out as much as possible. Mm -hmm. The other thing you can do is, um, you know, it, in, um, in Ecosim, you can start playing with the functional response parameter, the vulnerability parameters. Um, and you can, um, you can basically uh, make the system less top-down, so tune down your vulnerabilities to the point where, um, uh, where Ecosim looks more like Atlantis. Um, so we, we know we can do that. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not the published field at all Ecosim model, but you can sort of get that behavior. Um, to do that and really justify it, you would have to sort of refit that model to historical data. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Did you have your hand up earlier? Could, could you go back to the, to the um, slide with the Copepot slide? The Copepot slide, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, uh, Everybody likes the Copepot slide. <laughs> the reviewers demanded it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'm glad you like it. It's only Atlantis is predicting their decline. It was, it's not both, it's not, is that right? Uh, that's the, right. You had, yeah, Atlantis is, is yeah. So, that's right. Because aren't the forage fish eating a couple pods? Um, yes, they are. A lot of other things are eating copepods too, though. Um, yeah, I, I need to go back and look at my yeah. copepod results, but um, <laughs> we've, we've dealt with this before, and I just forgot to review it this morning, but right. yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm sorry, I just wanted to see this, this slide again. Yeah, Atlantis is predicting that copepods decline when forage fish decline. <laughs> Ecosim is, is predicting a slight Did increase. Do they go through the microzooplankton? I mean, are there, is there any predation maybe from spy through the microzooplankton? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll get back to you. This is, yeah, yeah. This, I think there's a nice section in the paper on this. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. You talked a lot about the pressures. Uh, you know, these are bad things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll try not to give you a seizure here with this. Um, yeah, so, you know, there's a, unfortunately, there's kind of a jargon for the IEA on the West Coast. Um, but w I think we're trying to use pressures to mean um, things like this, which I think are primarily negative impacts. So dredging, nutrients. So would, would you say any of these are stimulators? Uh, are nutrients really negative? Ah, OK, OK. Well, um, uh, so coastal rock, you have you show point, non-point source runoff. Yeah. Are, are those good or bad? Um, In other terms, are they pressure or stimulators? Uh, well, for areas. Uh, for instance, in Monterey Bay, with huge nutrient inputs from Central California coming through the Salinas River, um, I mean there there are negative effects right there, local negative effects of all that nutrient coming. Uh, okay. Um, well, I, I I guess I'm I'm not in charge of the the jargon department. Um, I can just tell you the way the way we're using it. And I like for me, you know, when I look at fisheries removals here. Fishery removals, in one sense, it's a pressure on sort of the ecosystem. On the other sense, fishery removals is a, is a goal. I mean, that's, that's a good thing if you want to put labels on it. Um, I, I'm not sure what to tell you, really. Um, basically, we, the jargon right now is that pressures are these things, these, these um, human activities that are causing um, uh, impacts on the attributes that we've identified as key attributes of interest in the ecosystem for the IEA. Um, and then talking about upwelling, these, so for instance, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, El Nino, and a series of upwelling indices, those are all things that we happen to put into our indicator section. And we use those, we report on those as, as um, 
indicators that, for instance, the Fishery Management Council should be aware of. Um, and these are, I mean, certainly PDO drives productivity, El Nino drives productivity, coastal upwelling drives productivity. And those are, I think those are conveyed pretty clearly to the, for instance, to the Fishery Council. The upwelling? Um, I don't think there's anything about blooms, but um, well, bloom is with yeah, yeah. But we, I'm just saying we don't actually have an indicator time series of <coughs> monitoring focused on upwelling. Um, but the upwelling itself, so at three degree latitude blocks, we've calculated um, back and up upwelling. It's easy to pull off the web. Um, yeah, and those are reported as a, sort of a key indicator, as well as things like the um, the spring transition and uh, some upwelling indices from Steve Bograd. So yeah, they, we know those are sort of key descriptions of the nutrients and the physics of the system, and, and uh, those are important things to track. Yeah? Um, because the adaptive management needs both the availability and quality of data that's monitored, when you present this to the fisheries council or end, in the end result to fishermen, is there support? For um, or institutions institutions in place to make sure that the monitoring occurs. If, if you get the models going and things look good and everybody goes okay, fine, then they don't stop monitoring a lot of your values that you're putting into that model. That's true. Well, um, and and you're not thinking in particular about the Atlantis model. You're just thinking about sort of the IEA process just in general, the, whole the adaptive IEA management. Process I yeah. think you even had the graph where you had yeah. it there, and you, you noticed that there was that link of adaptive management. Yeah. Well, I think, um, I mean, the, the truth is that, that takes m most of what the IEA is doing now is synthesizing existing data. Mm -hmm. So the justification for those monitoring programs is not couched in the IEA. It's, uh, for instance, a lot of it's coming from the ground fish trawl survey, which is probably funded by stock assessment needs. Um, there's physical oceanography that's been going on for 50 years, um, surveys and, and now, you know, satellite work. Um, so essentially we're a synthesis operation. Um, and so I think that the, sort of the original needs for those monitoring series continue and we're just sort of using them for our own purposes to understand the ecosystem as a whole. Um, yeah, I also don't, I don't think anything has reached the point where anyone would declare success and go home. So, <laughs> uh, you know, we still have overfished rockfish. Some of them have recovered, but we still have overfished rockfish. Um, we still have plenty of issues on the West Coast. So I don't want to keep you too uh, long. Cam probably wants to. Yeah, well, maybe I'll probably just uh, roll in and take the last question. Um, okay. <laughs> Um, so the way to answer that is to go to the Lenfest Ocean Report and look at what Tim Essington did with his, um, he calls it the PREP equation. So it's essentially an equation that, I have, a, I have slides on it, I think, here somewhere. Um, so I don't know if it's nonlinear or not, but I think we could find out the answer. Uh, Yeah, so from an ecosystem modeling perspective, um, and I'd like to see this in the data, in empirical data, but from, from modeling results from 10 ecosystem models that Tim looked at, oh, that's no good. That's not going to help you. Um, <laughs> never mind. There's no titles on there, so that's not going to help right now. Um, uh, anyway, Tim looked at this in a modeling context and um, basically predicted what proportion of prey needs to be available to predators given their, um, given their reliance on it. Um, it's called the PREP equation. 
Um, and you could look and see how, how nonlinear those relationships are. Um, but yeah, and he broke it out by taxa. So you've got marine mammals, you've got birds, you've got fish, as well as a general category. Um, but I'd like to see more of a focus on empirical data and other species besides birds. Yeah. All right, well, thank you, Isaac. Yeah, thanks.